Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Well, last week, we went back to the year 1922, and we tracked through the words of a very famous sermon written and delivered by Harry Emerson Fosdick on tolerant Christian fellowship and accepting an inclusive Christian fellowship. Inclusive in the sense that it called for an open communion table, rejecting no one. It called for tolerance for every belief except for one, that is fundamentalism. The title of the sermon was, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And it was at this point that the fundamentalists became sort of the public whipping boy. 1922. Essentially, to review a little bit, Fosdick called for reason, for logic, for understanding, as new scientific developments changed the focus of human intention and belief. He said Christianity must shift to accept these new situations. Belief in a deity who controls the universe is outmoded. He said belief in a special theory of atonement, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, is outmoded. He said the Christian fellowship should include people who believe anything. It doesn't matter what you believe. The idea is not creed, but ethics. Your creedal belief is secondary to your ethical behavior, he said. As far as the virgin birth, as far as the blood atonement, as far as, well, any of those old and ancient, time-worn, shop-worn ideas are concerned, he said those are outmoded. They've got to eventually go the way of all good beliefs. They've got to be forgotten. And in particular, the external idea of Christ coming in the clouds of glory, he said, is an idea that just has to be, has to be done away with because it interferes with the growth of faith. He said, this belief that Jesus is coming in the clouds makes you just kind of sit still and do nothing, and meantime, the world's growing worse and worse. He says, these old ideas have to be done away with. You can read his sermon, Shall the Fundamentalists Win, delivered June 10th, 1922. This morning on the way to church, I heard a preacher reviewing the work of a contemporary theologian by the name of Robert Funk, who has written a book in which Funk calls for the abandoning of the blood atonement. The idea of the blood atonement, says Mr. Funk, is simply an antique and superstitious idea. He said also that the idea of the virgin birth is practically insane. And he said, we've got to get used to the fact that Jesus had a biological father, he said, for heaven's sakes, this old notion. Oh, and he says, we must exorcise from Christianity, and he uses that term, exorcise. We must exorcise from Christianity the apocalyptic elements. None of this second coming garbage. And he says, we must have no more patience with the left behind phenomenon and the left behind mentality. Now I heard that on the radio driving to church this morning and I was thinking of good old Harry Emerson Fosdick in 1922, basically laid that doctrine out. The debate is creeds versus ethics. What do you believe, creeds or ethics? Creeds would be the Nicene Creed, would be the fundamentals of the faith, the virgin birth, the atonement, the divine plenary expression of God's word, and so forth, the miracles of Christ. We've been through them a thousand times. Do we believe creeds, or are we going to simply accept ethics as our guide? Ethics being good behavior, doing good things, thinking good thoughts, or as I like to call it, the theology of good is better than bad because it's nicer. That's essentially what it boils down to. We're in a battle. The position of watchful waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is basically a battle. Back in 1922, when Harry Emerson Fosdick said, we've got to start believing in the doctrine of evolution because after all, it's been proved scientifically. And he goes back to the days of Copernicus and Kepler. And 
Einstein, of course, had begun to deal with the physics that undermines the old global concepts of physical reality, that unlocks the power of the atom, monstrous new weaponry, the self-destruction of mankind was becoming a possibility. I think back to poor old Harry and his delusion that we've got to get on board with the scientists, and I don't know what Harry would do if he were alive today, because animal, human, embryo research has been approved by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority of Britain. That means it's now okay to create sheep, human, cow, human, pig, human embryos for scientific experimentation. Hey, they're doing it. These were called chimeras in the old days, you know, back in the days of the Greek philosophers. We had the half-human, half-goat, the half-human, half-horse. In the days of the Egyptians, we had the half-human, half-jackal, half-human, half-bird. All these were the gods that were worshipped. And now it's okay for the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority of Britain to come along and say, go for it, guys, because out of this is going to come a blessing for humanity. We may be able to heal some new diseases. By the way, you know what those human-animal combinations are being called? Cybrids. C-Y-B-R-I-D-S. You might add that to your vocabulary list. A cybrid. I don't know about you, gives me a cold chill. Know what I mean? Makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I don't want to see a pit bull come running down the street with a human head on it. I just don't. I... <laughs> Pardon me. Meanwhile, liberal Christianity mocks the ancient promise of Christ's return. The cry that Christ is coming is to them a false hope. They scoff at the teaching of the apostles. The gospel, the doctrines, the teaching, very carefully laid out history and explanation of God's redemptive pattern. It's all laid out very, very carefully by divine inspiration. And the higher critics say, no, scholarship really has proven that all of those things are just myths made up by a bunch of semi-literate people. After all, they were just fishermen. What did they know? And Jesus, of course, was not born of a virgin. He was just a smart guy and a great teacher. You've heard it all. You've heard it all. But if we simply return to the classic orthodox doctrine of the apostles, we avoid two millennia of human opinion that's been slathered on top of Scripture. The detritus of 2,000 years of human opinion smeared like so much plaster on top of clear-cut Bible doctrine in order to pacify kings, noblemen, pseudoscientists, astrologers, alchemists. The Word of God has just been ripped upside down and backwards. When Paul wrote to Timothy, very carefully laying out to Timothy that the enemy was false teaching, he said, you know, Timothy, the Spirit speaks expressly. In other words, the Spirit of God speaks in very plain terms, saying that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. You know, that's pretty stout stuff, the doctrines of devils. But the doctrines of devils are really easy to understand once you become sensitized to what they are. He said, Timothy, they're the doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, these people have decided what they want to believe and they have adopted the beliefs of the world system in order to move forward with their own particular plan. They don't care. They don't care if there is opposition of some sort or if they're running counter to classical opinion. They don't care because they have a new plan. First Timothy ends with these words. I'm sure you know them. You've heard them before, but think about them in this context. Paul says, O oh, Timothy, and the O oh in there is in the Greek. If you read O Timothy in Greek, you know what it sounds like? O Timothy. That's what it says. O Timothy. And you know what that means? As Paul, it's a heart's cry from Paul. He's saying, Oh, Timothy. He says, Keep that which is committed to thy trust. What is 
keeping that which is committed to thy trust. That would be the doctrine of Paul, the epistles of Paul. It would be the writings of the New Testament. It would be the stories of Christ's coming, his teaching, his death, burial, resurrection. Keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and the oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Now, if that isn't today's news, I don't know what is. I'm sure you're all tuned in to the intelligent design controversy. It's today's news. Can we pass a state law allowing the teaching of creation in the public school system? Well, isn't that a total reversal? We would have to pass a law allowing the teaching of creation? It should be the other way around. There ought to be a fight about allowing evolution to be taught, but no. And by the way, many legislatures around the United States have attempted to pass legislation. In some cases, it's passed and then been overturned by courts by the federal courts, those wonderful systems that were elevated to their present position by the ACLU, enough about that, but science, falsely so called. The scientific method back in the days of Francis Bacon and back in the days of Newton and Johannes Kepler, Newton, Bacon, you know, the scientific method was a method that was designed to investigate nature and then make comments about the natural world based upon observation. Do you realize that that definition of science has been turned on its head in our era? No longer is science a method, but it is an ontology. Today, scientists speak of doing science. I'm gonna do some science today, says the scientist. I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna eat my granola and I'm going to put my thongs on and my jeans. I'm going to schlep on down to the lab, and I'm going to do some science. It's called doing science. Do you realize how wrong that is? Science is not something you do. It isn't. In the classic methodologies, you were not doing science, but rather applying science. There's a huge difference. Doing science means that you have made a decision about what you want to discover, and now you're going to go do the science that's necessary to, <laughs> to make sure that your belief system is upheld. You know, it's, it's sort of like reading the Bible. You can either read the Bible to learn what God has to say, or you can read the Bible, discovering there your own preconceptions, elevating your preconceptions to the level of religion, which is often done. Harry Emerson Fosdick did it. The scientific world then has become a religion. And Paul called it all those centuries ago when he said, Timothy, keep that which is committed to your trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and the opposition of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Some people have followed science rather than the faith. Can you believe that? Paul wrote this all those years ago, and it's just like today's news. Grace be with you, he says. Amen. Get out there and uphold what I have taught. Jesus also taught that faith in the world to which he would return in the future would be spoiled by the corruption of human institutions. And turn to Luke 17 and 18, and we're going to look at something very interesting in this context. Once, Jesus was teaching on his second coming. And it was in the context of his having cleansed some lepers. In Luke 17, 11, it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Of course, lepers were forbidden contact with the public. They were unclean. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. It came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Wow. There it is again. The Samaritans showing faith. Apparently the Jews, nine other people there, 
at least some of them were not Samaritans, and they just were very happy to be cleansed, but they didn't come back and worship Jesus. And Jesus answering said, Where there are not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith made thee whole. In this little episode of cleansing, we find a lesson on faith. The very thing we're talking about today, our position relative to the Lord in the days while we await his coming. Because in this context, Jesus begins to teach on the second coming. By the way, one of the three messianic signs was the cleansing of the leper. And the Jews, the house of David, knew that when Messiah came, he would heal the man born blind, he would cleanse the leper, and he would cast out the dumb demon. These were the three messianic signs expected by the house of David. Here Jesus fulfills one of those, and in that context, in verse 20, notice the behavior of the Pharisees. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them, said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. The subject was broached now. Well, somebody said some lepers had been cleansed. I don't know about that. Maybe they have and maybe they haven't. The Pharisees, you know, being Pharisaical, are going to weigh all this very carefully and have big discussions among themselves to decide just exactly how to take this whole thing and what this should mean concerning the kingdom of God. Because everybody knows when Messiah comes, the kingdom of God will be among us. And it appears maybe, maybe Messiah has come, says one man. Well, maybe not, says another man. But the lepers were cleansed. So the discussion is laid out here, and the Pharisees demanded to know when the kingdom of God was coming. Jesus answered, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. Ooh. In other words, you can gather all your scientists together and all your great opinion makers, your pundits, sages, soothsayers, and you can get your little abacuses, abacai, your slide rules, <laughs> your little hand calculators. You can figure out times and dates at places, and you can do anything you want to do, and you're not going to be able to figure out the kingdom of heaven by human observation. Why? Because it's a matter of faith, not human observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you, he says. Or better, in the Greek, the kingdom of God is among you. Well, at that time, the kingdom of God was among them. Jesus is the personification of the kingdom, and he's sitting in their midst. Now, he goes on in this discussion, and I want to skip down to Luke 18. Because the whole discussion comes down to this parable, Luke 18. He spake a parable unto them to this end. In other words, upon the subject in question, namely, when's the kingdom of God coming? And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. That's the setup. You ought to always pray and not to faint. Well, isn't that the way of the world? you're balanced between those two things. It's like you're balanced on a tightrope. You fall one direction and fall the other direction. It's a balancing act. You can pray or you can faint. And in a sense, all life is this clever balancing act. And you say, well, I don't do that. Well, yes, you do. We all are balanced between prayer and fainting, which is a metaphor for just losing it. But we fool ourselves with the notion that everything's okay and that life requires no spiritual maintenance or consciousness. He spoke this parable saying that a man ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. I've seen a lot of judges like that myself. How about you? <laughs> Here's a judge that doesn't fear God or man. There are a bunch of those around today, I'll tell you. And there was a widow in that city. She came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. Somebody done me wrong. I need justice, says this woman. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, 
nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, she's making my life miserable, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So here's this woman coming to an unjust judge and getting what she wants because she just hammers away at it and will not give up at all. Men always ought to pray, Jesus says, and not to faint. He's giving an example here of a woman assaulting a judge who doesn't fear God or man, and she gets justice because she prays to that judge. And he's an unjust judge. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. Listen to this, he says. You ought to take this to heart. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? You know, Jesus was beyond wise. And you understand Jewish dialogue, the Hebraic system of reasoning called pilpul, in which wise men in their discussions ask each other questions. And the goal of such a discussion is to ask such an intelligent question that there's no answer for it at all. You've just asked the perfect question. Well, here Jesus asks a perfect question. After talking long and loud with these people who want to know when the kingdom of God is coming, in the light of all of the controversial elements, the political elements, the theological elements, the metaphysical element, everything from how many angels can dance on the head of a pin to how are we going to redistribute all the grain and all the stops in between, Jesus comes along with this little parable about a woman and an unjust judge. She's a widow, has no recourse. And he concludes with the perfect question, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? How do you answer this question? Can you answer this question? I can answer the question, but it's only for me. It's not for you. You have to answer the question yourself. And it can't be answered on a group level. You have to personally answer this question. And your personal answer is either no, probably not, I don't think I can be faithful until he comes. I just can't see myself being faithful. Or the answer to the question is, yes, I'm going to remain faithful until he comes. When he comes to me personally, he's going to find faith. But I can't answer for you. No one can answer for anyone else. And that woman and that judge is the perfect illustration of faith, if you know what I mean. She had nothing except her own perseverance. And by the way, the book of Revelation, the seven churches of Revelation, is all about overcoming, right? Him that overcometh. That's the subject of the seven churches of Revelation. The idea of overcoming includes the idea of perseverance. And faith and perseverance are necessary because we live in a world system. Jesus' parable featuring, starring the unjust judge is a picture of the world system. The unjust judge is a picture of the world. He fears neither God nor man. And so this is a gigantic parable. It's a parable of the world system. The widow woman is a parable of the plight of a human being relative to the world system. Have you ever felt like you're beating your head against a wall on some count or another when you run up against the world system? Well, we all have those occasions. It's the common experience. And the big question is, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Notice he didn't say, shall he find faith in the world? Not at all. He says, shall he find faith on the earth? This is a geophysical construct. The earth is a sphere that revolves around the sun in orbit. It's a physical thing. Finding faith on the earth 
is quite different from finding faith in the world. The world is the world system. It is the psyche of the world, the zeitgeist of the world. It is the belief systems and physical and political constructs, uh, uh, the geopolitical earth. But this is the physical earth here, and Jesus is coming back to it one of these days in physical form. And this is the thing that's hated by the liberals. They want to do away with this idea of the second coming of Jesus in the clouds. But Jesus poses the question himself. When he comes, shall he find faith on the earth? If he were to ask you that question right now, how would you answer? I would hope that you'd answer by falling at his feet and saying, yes, Lord, I'm going to be faithful until you come. I don't know about all these other people, but I am going to be faithful. I would try to answer the question that way. You see what I'm saying? This is Jesus bringing a global event down to the life of a single widow woman, picking one person out of society who is perhaps the most vulnerable person you can imagine. A first century widow woman has no recourse, but she does have faith, and she is the very picture of faith. The judge is the world system. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. The earth is a physical globe. The world is the universe, both physical and non-physical. It is the Greek cosmos, And to the ancient Greeks who invented the word, cosmos means everything that can be seen or perceived on any level or even imagined. For example, the other dimensions that we can see in our mind's eye or mathematically, but we cannot see them with our physical eyes. This is the world. It is the untouchable system of the ebb and flow of spiritual power and of spirituality and of evil even. As in the book of Daniel, where you have the prince of Persia fighting the messenger who came to Daniel. It is a swirling mist of sometimes very contradictory ideas. Sometimes it appears peaceful, sometimes not so peaceful. It's the world. 1 John 2.15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The cosmos, translated as world, and it means if you love the system, and by the way, it's easy to love the system, very easy, because you can't at a certain point in your life say, okay, hey, I'm going to get in there with both hands and both feet. I'm going to do everything I can to make it in the world. I'm going to make my place. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible does not condemn making your way in the world. Some Christians have become very wealthy, incredibly wealthy, and used their wealth to further the cause of Christ. There's nothing at all wrong with this. But at the same time, they didn't love the world. It's possible to be a very, very big part of the world and not love it. To be a very big part of the world and yet look forward to Christ's coming, to set everything straight. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And if I could, I'd show you like a 30-second movie on the screen, which should be hanging behind me up here. And the 30-second movie would show all of the wonderful things in the world. Everything from Ferraris and wonderful airplanes to the Louvre, to the Smithsonian Institution, to the marvelous five-star restaurants around the world, and the goodies, and beautiful things. You know, I'd run about a 30-second movie while reading verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. That is, this world system is going to pass away. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ in the doctrinal sense, not in the liberal ethical sense, in the doctrinal sense, you know that this world's passing away. The world is not worth saving. The world system is incontrovertibly and irreparably corrupt. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, says John, 
It's the last time. And as you've heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it's the last time. They went out from us. They were not of us, for if they'd been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. John, I think here, is speaking as the bishop of the church of Ephesus, which he was. And as the bishop of the church of Ephesus, right there in the heart of Asia Minor, John saw divisions, schisms. He saw political conquests, risings and fallings. He saw it all at Ephesus before he died. And he saw a lot of people leave the church because back in those days in the Greek world, there was a lot to be said for just living in the world, making a lot of money, building yourself an estate, going off into some area where there was peace to be found and just living quietly there until the day you died. Forget about all this battle for the faith business. That there's nothing to be had in that but disappointment. And he said, you know, they went out from us that they might be made manifest they were not all of us, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. That is, you who are faithful have an unction. You've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and you know all things. Well, it's written in 1 Corinthians 2.16 that we have the mind of Christ. We do have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Wow. You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. You know, that one sentence right there is worth an hour, but we'll skip right on past it. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Jesus is Messiah. He's Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Hmm. Denies the Father and the Son. Remember Harry Emerson Fosdick's 1922 sermon, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? Where he said here, for example, is one point of view held by the fundamentalists that the virgin birth is to be accepted as historical fact, that it actually happened. There was no other way for a personality like the Master to come into this world except by a special biological miracle, he said. What nonsense, this special biological miracle. Well, that's a denial of the Father and the Son, because if Jesus wasn't virgin-born, he's not the Son of God. Do you understand? It's just that simple. And I can show you so many biblical proofs of the virgin birth of Christ that I don't have time to right now. There's one that'll just blow you away. That's right in the first chapter of Matthew. But if you deny that Jesus is Messiah and the Son of God, you are Antichrist. And there are many antichrists in the world who deny the Father and the Son. But you know what? The hatred for the divine Son of God was publicly expressed long, long before the 20th century. In fact, probably the best known denial is right on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. When you see a picture of Jerusalem, what do you see? And it always just galls me. It's always you see this golden dome of the rock right smack in the middle of the picture. That's Jerusalem. That's an offense unto mine eye, to use pseudo-Jacobean language. It, it just really, <laughs> it, it galls me to see that golden excrescence there on Mount Moriah. It just bothers me. Do you know it's an octagonal structure? You've seen pictures of it. It has a golden dome, and it's built like an octagon, and it's covered inside and out with very beautifully crafted porcelain tiles. And upon those tiles is Arabic writing, mostly from the Quran. And it has an outside octagonal wall, and then when you walk into it, it has an inside octagonal wall. And if you walk into it another level, it has another inside wall, and inside that is still another inside octagonal wall. Each of these walls is covered with tiles that are Arabic writing, and most of it is from the Quran. And I was reading about this, and thinking about Harry Emerson Fosdick, and I noticed that in 691 AD, the Dome of the Rock was dedicated. And some of the earliest 
porcelain design work on the inside of the Dome of the Rock has these words emblazoned. So if you walk in there today, you can still read it, if you can read Arabic. It says on the east wall, up high, it says, O people of the book, that's Christians, that's the Arabic term for a Christian, if you read the Bible. O people of the book, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter anything concerning God except the truth. The Messiah, and by the way, this is written on the inside of the Dome of the Rock, the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of God, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary, and a spirit from him. So believe in God and his messengers, and say not three. Cease. It is better for you. What do those words mean? Well, Jesus was the son of Mary by a physical union with another man. He was a messenger of God who had a special spirit. It's okay, they say, to believe in God and his messengers. Jesus was a prophet, that's okay. But say not three, cease, it is better for you. What does that mean, say not three? It means to deny the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. That's written right on the inside wall of the Dome of the Rock. So next time you see a picture of downtown Jerusalem, you see that golden dome, just remember what's written inside there. It is better for you, they say, not to believe in this trinity. God is only one God. Far be it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. You get that? Far be it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. Well, that's a stain on God that he should have a son, according to what's written inside of the Golden Dome of the Rock. And then you move around to the northwest side of the inner wall. It says, O oh God, bless your messenger and your servant Jesus, son of Mary. Peace be on him the day he was born and the day he dies and the day he shall be raised alive. You get that? This is a blessing, blessing Jesus and Mary. And it says, peace be on him, that is Jesus, the day he was born, the day he dies, the day he shall be raised alive. In other words, he hasn't been raised alive yet. That's still awaiting Allah's bidding. In the future, Jesus will be raised as a prophet. And he will then bow down to Allah. Okay? Such was Jesus, son of Mary. Let me read that again. Such was Jesus, son of Mary not son of God. He's the son of Mary through physical union. This is a statement of truth concerning which they doubt. It befitteth not the majesty of God that he should take unto himself a son. Glory be to him when he decreeth a thing he saith unto it only be and it is. Let me just paraphrase that in modern English. Such was Jesus son of Mary this is a statement of truth. It is not appropriate to the majesty of God that he should take unto himself a son. When he decrees something, all he has to do is say, be, and it is. Why would he ever have a son? That's the question that's being raised there by the words that are emblazoned across the inner walls of the Dome of the Rock. So, to paraphrase and to review, Jesus was only a prophet. He was the physical son of Mary and some other man, most possibly a Roman soldier. That was the accepted thought. He's not a part of any trinity. God is only one God. It's not appropriate to the majesty of that God that he should take unto himself a son. Far be it removed from him that he should ever have a son. Now, how do you feel when you hear those words spoken? Really? You see, my point in this this morning is that you and I are not just inline skaters, you know, with our elbow pads and our helmets on, just breezing down the Hefner exercise path. We are not just skating through this world. We're upholding the doctrine of God, the one and only doctrine of God. 
And there is only one. And there's a fight out there. People are chipping away at it. Lots of people. These words that I just read to you were propounded back in the 8th century A.D. The sermons preached in the 20th century were simply a reflection and perhaps a refinement of these earlier thoughts. But the original expression of those thoughts can be found right here in 1 John. Verse 22 of chapter 2. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Verse 22. If you deny that there's a connection of God the Father, God the Son, and by the way, God the Holy Spirit, because John includes all three in this epistle, this is spirit of Antichrist. Whosoever, verse 23, denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Now I want to conclude on this note because we're talking about waiting for the coming of Christ with the knowledge that there are people out there who think that waiting for the second coming of Christ is a stupid thing to do. And they're trying to overthrow the idea, trying to overthrow the blood atonement, the virgin birth, the whole idea of Jesus coming again in the clouds to take his people to glory and then judging the earth. That's all fairy tales to them. But it's what I breathe every day. It is my life. Now, little children, this is 1 John 2:28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. It's not only him. He's the first and only begotten Son of God. At this point, we're going to be sons of God in the same glorified sense that He is. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear... We shall be like him, for he shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. We have to remind ourselves of who we are and what we believe. We just have to. I go back to that little widow woman who went and beat on the door of the unjust judge over and over and over again. I want justice. Here she was flailing about in the world system and getting justice. And Jesus used that as a way of asking the question, when the Son of Man returns to the earth, will he find faith? That's the question. I can't answer it for you. 